Hi everyone, I'm Chase Haskell and welcome to What a Flanker, the podcast. Today's guest is a man who's won most things in the world of rugby, who has more medals and trophies than almost any coach in the history of the game. Someone who's responsible for starting my career in the professional game and shaping me as a player. He's coached Wales, Connor, Ireland, London Wasps, Waikato and of course the Lions. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Warren Gatland. How you doing, James? Good, good boss, how are you? I'm very good, thank you, yeah, so... Still coming to grips with the whole lockdown thing after coming from New Zealand, but um, it looks like things are moving in the right direction. Were you in New Zealand during the, the, the whole period? Because obviously we see on TV that the concerts are back up. New Zealand's been sort of, you know, virus free for a while. Went back after the World Cup, um, and they had a few cases, and we were in a two month lockdown, um, which um, I found fantastic because it was just a great time to spend time with the family. That. I wouldn't have normally done so that was that was brilliant for us and we had gabby and her now husband there now and brendan his girlfriend all at the beach which was brilliant was that the first time in sort of a long time you've actually spent a prolonged time not involved in rugby and sort of relaxing yeah it was and you know i know it was difficult for people a lot of people in lockdown but we were very very fortunate to have that time together and the boys were training and we had been cooking competitions at, at night and a few different games and you know, Pictionary and beer pong and whatever. So did it get no, compe- that time. Did it get competitive? I can imagine oh. in the Gatlin household, like it started off friendly, but after a while people were going you know, at each other's throats until boards got thrown on the floor and Yeah. And got very competitive. I love that. I love And we did a uh, we had a we had a, we had a laugh at it, did a few TikTok things as well and Bryn posted them. Um Ah, that's good. So you, you so you've got you've got time. some TikTok followers now, Warren, that you didn't even know you had before, now, have you? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, we did some some sort of a segment thing on the stairs where you were supposed to be going backwards and forwards and trying to, <laughs> and I was absolutely shocking. So oh. they, they took the piss out of me for that. Well, I, I never would have thought that Warren Gatlin of all people would have got on TikTok, but it shows you the world we live in in lockdown. That you know, spending time with your family is dangerous because before you know it, you're a media star and you didn't even know you were. Uh, you've got to have a bit of fun. You've got to enjoy yourself. That's that's a big part of it. Did you find that um, the time away from rugby has kind of made you fall in love with it a little bit more? You were desperate to get back? Yeah, I think I, I really, really enjoy that family time and, and the break and being able to, to get away. That kind of just definitely refreshes me and gives me that interest again because I'm involved in high-level sport. You know, there is a lot of pressures and a lot of expectations. So... Being able to have those those breaks, and even when I was with Wales, having the two sabbaticals with the Lions, that they, they were great for me because it was a chance to be with another team, different players, different coaches. So that definitely refreshed me as well. So yeah, no, it's it's good to not be in the you know the so called bubble of, of pressure all the time and, and try and get a balance. And that, I find that really important. So the reason I wanted to get you on the on the podcast, Warren, is 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 you know you helped shape my career, responsible for for starting me off on my kind of rugby journey. And and uh, I know if it wasn't for for you and Sean, I wouldn't have had the career I've I've had. And um, you know, you obviously your success speaks for it itself. Um, you know, I, I had Eddie Eddie Jones on on what a flanker um, the podcast series one, and I, I I always like to know what makes different coaches tick and how they become um, successful and what their kind of traits are but before we go into those details I think it's always important to kind of know where someone started so I'd love to know what it was like um, you know when you were, were a player growing up in New Zealand because everyone I talked to we, we interviewed Dan Carter last night for our um, for our co- podcast The Good, The Bad, The Rugby and, and he was saying that you know he always wanted to be a, a rugby player was that the same case for you? Yeah absolutely I mean I, my father took me down to the local rugby club at five and started playing and the dream was, um, you know, everyone's dreams to be an All Black and that was kind of what I had. And I was lucky enough as a young age, I'd played in good teams and had a bit of success as a player. I was a number eight until I was about 19 or 20 and realised I wasn't going to be good enough to be a loose forward and then and then changed to a hooker. So having that experience was good and I kept in a lot of teams growing up. And, um, yeah, just had a real sort of appetite for not just playing the game, but how the game was played in different ways and wanting to learn all the time and uh, you know, just you know, definitely was growing up. And that's probably what 
really led me into coaching and played club rugby. I was lucky enough to play a long time for Waikato and, and then have uh, four tours with the All Blacks, which were great experiences. I mean, I was doing my research on you last night and I couldn't believe that you, you were a number eight and then you voluntarily moved to Hooker. I, my question, I literally wrote down, what the fuck were you thinking? <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> that, that's a terrible idea to go from eight to Hooker. Yeah, played a little bit at seven as well, but, you know, I wasn't going to be tall enough to for the lineouts and I don't know if it was going to be quick enough or big enough for, for a loose forward and then moved into and into hooker and kind of the, at the time that the the hookers were seen as having that flexibility to be a little bit more loose so having been loose forwards that sort of helped me with that and you know you get your hands on the ball all the time throwing the ball in the line out and stuff and um yeah I, I really enjoyed it so um really enjoyed that sort of that change up and really competitive so um you know you come up against guys like sean fitzpatrick and stuff as, as your career goes on and and the challenges and and just wanting to improve. Now, I was thinking about this your move from to, from in an eight to hooker, and I wonder is that why that on that day at Wasps you made us do those a hundred scrums? Do you remember about that famous day you made a hundred scrums? And I now look at it and I understand it was about a mentality. But was it to teach all of us flashback row the pain that you had to go through to be put into <laughs> put into the front row? Yeah, I don't know. That was probably stupid of me doing that, but sometimes and. You'd understand that uh, training isn't always about doing the right things from a physical perspective. It's it's about the mental element as that as well, and you know, creating that mental edge. And I remember a couple of times, uh, you know, Whitey uh, Craig White coming over and saying, "What the hell are you doing? You what are you doing? You're doing you might have been doing something at training or doing a bit of extra fitness. See if you can mental at us." So we're not doing fitness; we're doing mental toughness exercise. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's probably moved away from that a little bit, but you know that being tough mentally is is so important in the game, and being able to go to dark places when you have to. But if you've done that in training at times, it's it's a little bit easier to do that in the games because you know the game now is, is so physical, it's so tough, um, and you've got to have that mental edge about you to to be able to perform at the highest level. No, no I want to explore that stuff, especially as you, you mentioned Craig White. He's actually going to come on the on the podcast, but we'll come on to that a little bit later. But I, I just on that on those 100 scrums, um, talk about mental toughness. I remember Simon Shaw pulled out after the third scrum, sight his neck, and then Joe Worsley, I've never forgiven him, pulled out with an arthritic toe, and I got in the second row. So for 95 scrums, I went from living the, the life of Riley on the flank to getting stuck in those scrums. I think that's what probably ended my career before it even <laughs> before it even started. So that was a big day, that. Yeah, but, you know, it's something I definitely wouldn't do now. I mean, <laughs> I suppose in a week, those are things that we used to do. I can remember regularly on a Tuesday night sort of doing 60 or 80 scrums at a, at a Waikato training and, and sets of five. And those are the things we did. And you built up a, a resistance to it. And, and But nowadays probably in a week's preparation for a test match. You might do half a dozen live scrums and maybe at the most about 10 on the scrum machine. That's that's all that's been done. And a lot of one-on-one stuff and you know, two-on-twos, three-on-threes. Um, but definitely the volume has significantly come down to when I was playing. When, so when you were young, just going back to that, do, who were your idols as a, as a, a young player? Who, you know, like, who do you look up to in the old All Blacks that was like someone I wanted to emulate? Hmm. Oh, I, I, for me, it was always the backs. Um, Ryan Williams, uh, Grant Batty, Stu Wilson, those sort of guys. Uh, I loved a game being played in an open way. And, and um, yeah, so I don't know. It was never good enough to be a back, but I always fancied myself a little bit. But um, hated playing in the rain, hated the wet, loved the idea of playing in and dry conditions and, and the ball being moved, moved around. So, you know, probably in New Zealand, those times you talk about guys like Colin Meads who are icons and forwards, but, you know, definitely you know, some of those earlier backs, in particular the wings, um, you love to see them score tries. When you, when you were playing, did you ever think you would be a coach? Is it, is it something that tickled your fancy while you were doing it? I probably was always destined to, to do that. I can remember 
being the Hamilton Boys High School and captain of the first 15 and coach at the time, Glenn Ross, you know, just always get me in his office and we'd talk about tactics and he'd ask my opinion and talk about selection and stuff. So I think I was always going that way. And then there was a, uh, one of the All Black tours in 1989, we toured Wales and Ireland and I got on, asked to stay on as a club coach in, in Galway in the west of Ireland. And I was, as a player coach, I was 25 and then went back to New Zealand as club coach for my club side as well. So um, as a player coach, so I kind of went into it as a really, at a really young age as a as a as a player coach, and then from there, after I retired, um, you know, had the opportunity when the game went professional to to go into full time coaching. So I know I know this is talked about loads of times, um, you know, and famously for people who may be not familiar with rugby or familiar with yourself, obviously. You had a fantastic career, you know, at Waikato. You played 17 times in non-international matches for New Zealand, but you never actually got a chance uh, to come off the bench because when you played, it was when they would only make substitute if someone was injured. And obviously, Sean Fitzpatrick, not a bad person to be ahead of you, um, sadly didn't appear to ever get injured. My first question is, did you not ever think about running him over in the car park or filling him in? Because that's what I would have done. And... (laughs) And, and the mentality I learned from you and Sean, I probably would have done that. If I'd been playing for you and you'd been coached, you would have said, listen, Hask, just fill him in. Yeah, it's, it's a tough one because, you know, how do you get, when you're in the All Blacks, there's, there's two things of probably getting into the test side. And one is that the team loses and plays poorly. And you don't really want to be, you know, on an All Black tour that the team's losing a few games and not playing well. Or the other one, he gets injured. And... And that wasn't the case. So, you know, like I just had to bide my time. It was, I think it's, when I reflect back on it, I think it was a great experience to be able to impart that knowledge or that experience onto players as a coach because you know what it's like to, to not be selected. You've got to still believe in yourself and back yourself and be disappointed that you're not, uh, you haven't been selected. But then it's, it's that responsibility afterwards, how you respond to that disappointment and then putting the team first and helping the team prepare for, for the weekend in the best possible way, way you can. And I thought I was always really positive about that. And you know, for me, I, I expect my players to be disappointed about selection and, you know, come to me and, you know, what can they do? And, uh, and I understand their disappointment, but a player throws his toys out of the cot and sulks around and, you know, I, I, that, I, I can't, I find that very disappointing and those sort of players won't be in my teams for that long. They need to change their attitude. It's about the team coming first and I'm, I'm a great believer in putting players first as well. You know, I think that's really, really important and and, and then the team. And um, So that gave me a really good understanding of kind of, I suppose, the selection process and the disappointments and how you handle that and then and I suppose more importantly than how you prepare and put in the team first to, to perform in the weekend. Now I know that you're, you know, having worked with you and, and, and seen you first action, you know, you're a competitive man, you you know, you're focused. I wondered whether your drive for success in coaching and the way you are is because you didn't make it as, as you would have wanted in rugby. You obviously had an amazing career, I know that, but I know how passionate you would have been to get onto the field, and if all the things you say are true, and I know I've read where, you know, we're going to talk later on about kind of the importance of squad people as well as leaders, but do you think the reason your fire burns so you know so much is because it's almost like coaching is a second bite of the cherry for you to achieve all you want to achieve? No, I don't, I don't look at it like that. I, I look at it about how fortunate I was to have the experiences I did as a player and, you know, not you know, sitting on the bench for all those test matches, not getting, not getting on, being on four tours and, and that experience. Um, something I remember sitting in the bus one day and looking out the window at a, at a training and all black bus and there were hundreds of people outside and I'm trying to get autographs and bits of peace. And I looked out and I said to myself, you know, don't take this for granted. And, and yeah, I, I think, when I retired, I put the playing side behind me and then, you know, definitely as a coach, um, you want to be successful as well and you want to be, you want to do everything you can to to prepare a team, uh, you know, to take it as high as you possibly can. And for me, success isn't always about winning. Success is about overachieving. And 
you know, you look at a team saying premiership football that gets promoted and everyone's talking about them being in a relegation zone. Well, no one expects them to, to be in the top four, but success for that side could be surviving relegation or mid-table. You know, that's, that's having a great year. So it's not always about winning. It's just about you know, doing better than the expectations are. Do you look back at those those early days and when you were professional uh, and look at some of the coaches you work with and see now people that you respected and guys really that stand out that, that were, were great for you, that really understood you and that have helped shape you as a coach now? Yeah, I, I think three coaches have had a massive influence on me. And, and I, I think when you work with coaches, you've got to take things that you see from them are like like from them, you've always got to add your own personality into it. But uh, Alex Wiley with the All Blacks, uh, he was incredibly tough. You know, in terms of he pushed us right to the limit, trained us so hard a, a, as a team, and kind of that's probably you know one of the things that that I've done, and not so much replicated what he did, but getting teams to be in the best possible shape they can be is definitely. Uh, one of the factors where I think I've had had success and then having the right fitness staff who you trust complicitly, uh, who they feel that, you know, that they've really got a real ownership and responsibility about their job and and doing that. So he, he definitely had an influence. Um, ben Ross, who coached me uh, at school and, and coached uh, at Waikato as well, he went on to he moved on coach at Northampton and, and at Connacht as well. Um, he probably, as a school teacher, was the, the first guy who, who came in and really uh, organised training sessions in terms of the amount of time a, a training session was going to be. This is how long we were going to do this drill for. This is how long this segment was going to be for. So you know, very well planned, very well structured in terms of training sessions. Um, and you know, definitely taking that element of uh, from him in terms of the way that he prepared teams. He was definitely ahead of his time with re with regard to that. And pr and probably the last guy was Kevin Green, who played for Waikato and, and was an all-black and had been successful as a club coach. And for me, Kevin uh, came into a Waikato team that was starting to have some real success. A lot of older players are really experienced. And for him... I took it as well, it was all about his man management. You know, he wasn't probably technically the greatest coach in the world, but the way he managed us as a group in terms of uh, getting the best out of us, um, you know, definitely I took something from from him as, as a coach. But, so those three coaches for me have had a pretty significant influence on me and my rugby career and, and rugby coaching and, and and taking out of the taking the elements out of them that I can mix in hopefully with my own personality and my own ideas. That's fascinating because obviously knowing you, I've seen those three elements. And actually later on, a lot, you know, a lot of the questions I wanted to ask you were, you know, for example, you know, you were, when you came and we can talk about it now, when you, when you came into Wasps, um, you know, your, your work with Craig White and your opinion on how you wanted to train and do things set a standard that is now universal in the Premiership. It was, and I don't think people can underplay it. I talked about it in my book, What a Flanker, about the fact that Wasps were pioneers. And the three things you've talked about are three things that I would say would be, if I was going to describe your coaching style, would be that. And, and you sort of took it to a next level, getting someone like Craig White in, who I don't think people realise you would manage a session and you would have told Whitey, this is how long we're going to, we're going to take. And he'd be shouting at you and saying, you know, you, Warren, you've said this. And you'd be like, right, can you take one minute off this scrummaging? We're going to give one more minute to the, the, the Blitz defence. It was that calculated. Whereas a lot of clubs were out there for two and a half hours kicking shit out of each other when we were so minutely managed in that particular area as well. Yeah, and if I look back at that as a player, you kind of, you see a lot of players who become coaches and then they completely go away from the things that they like doing or they enjoyed about training sessions. So for me, I hated long training sessions and I, but I didn't mind hard training sessions, but so I look at it and go, what's the maximum a player can go out there, push themselves um, and get the quality of a training session. I'd say 
70 minutes, maybe 75. That's including your warm-up stuff. So, you know, my training sessions tend to be between sort of 40 to 60 minutes, um, highly organised with high tempo. And the game changed, and probably for a number of years, was were definitely ahead of everyone else because of the, of the way that we had prepared. A lot of teams are still doing, you know, go out on a Sunday and do your 40 or 60 minute runs and, and training, train long training sessions. And we we just shortened everything up and had high intensity. It was all about repeatability, about to go hard, recover quickly, go hard again, recover, go hard. And, you know, a lot of strength and a lot of power that went into the way that we prepared. And it's still very much the format that, that I operate in today with uh, Paul Stridge and with the success we've had at, at Wales. They're very, very similar. And Wales take a little bit of time. And I, I thought the last 15 minutes, yes, I had some luck against England, but I thought the last 15 minutes they were they were excellent. And that, the reason it takes them a bit of time in tournaments is because they tend to come in from the regions who haven't been that successful. Players aren't in the best possible shape they should be. Uh, despite doing the work and then they come into a Wales environment and the intensity just ramps up. And that can take two or three weeks, four weeks to get, get them to the level that you want them to, to get to. And, and even working with someone like Sean Edwards, you know, he, he's gone into different teams before and he wants to implement a defensive situation or defensive plan. But the biggest thing for him is get, having his players fit. If his players are fit and able to do that, then... Yeah, that's eighty percent of your defence. So, you know, it's not it's not rocket science in, in terms of that. But definitely, we've probably developed a formula that you know we've found to be successful for us um, in doing that over over the years. And I'm not saying that's the right way, but it's, you know, it's definitely been something for me. With you know, I enjoy short trading sessions and don't have long meetings. You know. A meeting for us, a long meeting is about, about 20 minutes because I think 20 minutes is about the amount of time that people can, in a room can really concentrate and take information for. So you've got to be, you've got to be precise about the stuff that you're delivering to the, pay, uh, to the players, you know, not too much um, information. And I'll go back to Sean as well. I used to love doing his tip sheets. And I remember one day he came to me with a, defensive tip sheet and said, oh, this is what I'm going to give to the players. And I read through the sheet and there were 12 points on the sheet. And I turned it over and I went, Sean, I've just read through your sheet and I can't remember any of them. But I said, if you put two or three points on that sheet, I'll remember and I'll focus on them. So, you know, often there's lots of things you want to cover in a week, but it's not about trying to cover everything. It's, it's about prioritising the three or four most important things of the week that we've got to work on or improve on to hopefully give us a performance in the weekend. It always seems like you go and put the components together and lay the plan after that, and you're not worried about almost being challenged with different personalities. Your your job is put the best people in, and then we'll make it work, as opposed to you worried about egos or other coaches, because some people are intimidated to be challenged. They talk about being challenged or having someone who's better than them, but they often can't deal with that. Yeah, well, uh, I I love to be challenged. It's, It's the only way to move forward, you know, so... People in the environment. I mean, Wiley and I over the years, or Paul Strickland, not not so much Bobby, but you know, we've had had our words at times. But but they feel comfortable uh, being able to come to me and know that there's not going to be any repercussions because that's the only way we can improve. And I want the same with coaches as well. I want me to be able to, to challenge them, and I want them challenging me on on certain things and certain ideas. You know, we don't always agree, but. There's often middle ground of finding a consensus. Very much, and very much the same with selection too. I, you know, I don't go in and say this is the team, and um, yeah, it's definitely a, a big input from from the other other coaches. And sometimes they have a very strong opinion about a player, and I, I, I'll I'll back them. Other times I, I feel differently about a player, and they may back me. And then once the decision's made, then it's it's made collectively and we go out there and we back each other hundred percent about those decisions. So yeah, I, yeah, look, I've been incredibly lucky to you know, for a long, you know, trying to get Craig White. And then I was lucky enough to get Paul Stridgen after he'd been um, with England and gone 
down to Toulon to, to come to Wales, get in Prev Mathema um, uh, from from Wasps as well. He's, I think he's world class in, in this field. We've got a great set of analysts as well, and and then get coaches who you you really respect. Um, we've worked with um, obviously with Sean Edwards and Rob Howley, and and Robin McBride was was a little bit different because when I first came to Wales, he'd just come out as being a player. He'd been a player a couple of years early and then sort of got thrust into the forwards coaching role. And when I first arrived, I went, oh, my God, what have I got here? You know, really young and experienced coach. But to see him develop over 10 years and just continue to improve and strive to be better, um, you know, I took a lot of pleasure out of watching him develop into you know, what I consider Best class coach. Now, the third coach you talked about was kind of a bit of an old school kind of mentality, you know, that mental toughness. We were joking about the, the, the hundred scrums at the start. And, you know, I, is, it, I, is it fair to say that you sort of are, of, you know, have a lot of, you know, modern day thinking, but with a lot of old school values in terms of some of the way you are? Like when I remember at WAS early days, seeing it with the Lions, talking to the Wel- Welsh boys. You want guys to be highly professional. You want guys to train intensely, but you want boys to enjoy themselves at the right time. And that's reasonably unique in, in the modern game because a lot of people sort of shy away from encouraging the guys to have a beer and let their hair down. Oh, I think it's, I think it's vital. I think it's really, really important. So one of the things probably I've probably learned in the last period is as I come into a team now and, and I talk about how lucky we are to do what we do and and we get paid to play rugby and, and stuff in there but there's something more important than that and that's your family and but you can't you can't walk the walk you have talk the talk you've got to walk the walk and so any time a player comes to me and there's, there's an issue at home or there's a funeral or something or or a player's wife's going for a scan um probably the most unusual request they ever had was from samson lee who was going to the Clinethley Council one day during training to apply for a caravan site for his family um, nice. uh, to, to be able to build it. And it was really important to him. So I kind of, yes, yeah, so I said, Samson, yeah, yeah, no problem. And I, and I look at it and go, yeah, they might be missing a training session, but how many times do you get a player who's got a little niggle and doesn't train anyway? So I just think, oh, yeah, I just treat it like that. And so, you know, for us, it's about the family stuff. So if, if things are right at home and the players are happy and the partners are happy, then I get a much better product of training. I get a much better product in the weekend. And then if we play well and we'll run something, then, yeah, I'd go out there and, and have a few beers and, and enjoy yourselves. And But, yeah, that's definitely changed. I mean, guys will go through campaigns now and not have a drink and they might have a drink at the end of it. And a couple of others will have a, a couple of quiet beers. They're, they're so much more professional than they were um you know a while ago so um it's uh yeah just trying to get that that whole thing that whole thing right um it, you know, can definitely make a big difference if i was going to select a coach to put together a team in a short space yeah. of time you'll be my first name on the list why do you think you're so good at putting teams together and getting them to bond so quickly and how important do you think that bonding is <sighs> I don't, I don't really know the answer to that, James. It's kind of like, I suppose the biggest challenge has been the Lions and kind of we've, you know, the unfortunate thing is what's the quickest way for a group of guys to bond is, is probably having a night out and having a few beers and, and uh, you know, let, let your hair down a bit and start chatting. And, and So we'll always do that early on, uh, trying to find the right time, you know, without... And trying to be sensible without being stupid, of course, and and then again, how do you make people feel a part of it? Where I'm going away on tour, and I feel like I genuinely have an opportunity, you know. Um, so with the Lions thing, it's been uh, the two tours I've been head coach for is, and it does compromise your preparation a little bit. But you know, I say to all the players, as long as you're fit, you'll get a start in the first three games. Now, if I'm a, if I'm if I'm a player going on tour, I think, well, I know I'm going to start in the first three games, you know, if there's three tens or three nines or, or three hookers or whatever, then I feel like 
mm, I've got an opportunity here. I put myself in the shop window, and if I play well and the team plays well, then you know, maybe there's chances for me later on in the tour. So, you know, and again, you know, trying to get those other elements right with the players go onto the training field where, you know, the structure's right, they're enjoying training, they're not for too long. Um, got to get things right with the team room and uh, guys rooming together. Food's got to be right. Um, and basically the day and what was the, the thing that we tried to do with Wales was how do you create a no excuse environment for the players and so there are no excuses about we're providing everything we can for you in terms of facilities and coaches and support staff and the way that we prepare the way that we train that there isn't an excuse for you not to go out on the field and perform and then if you can do that then maybe you give yourself you know some sort of chance so there, there are a lot of things that you're trying to put together do you think as well it's a lot to the staffing you get around you? I know you said about the backroom staff, but it seems just getting the players to go out for a beer obviously you know has, it, has its benefits. But like you said, taking away all the excuses, so comfortable beds, co- comfortable hotel, good transport, good logistics, everything's taken care of, kit, no excuses. But also it's kind of, it seems to be the staff you surround yourself with. So you've, you've mentioned Paul Stridgen a few times. In, 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 I talk about him in What a Flanker, or Bobby Boucher, a.k.a. The Rope, uh, the healing rope. Yeah. He gets he gets a full chapter on his, on his own. People love him. He's like a, a folk <laughs> a folk hero. Um, he's fixed more injuries to the rope than anything else. Um, but he he's someone that I quote I quote you in the book as well, saying you know, he's your first name on a team sheet. Now, he's so important to Bongley because of his emotional energy as well as your other staff if you've got good staff around you who compliment you so you can be head coach and kind of be involved but you're still head coach and everyone knows but you've got good sympathetic compassionate people around you that surely makes bonding easier as well oh massively and i don't want people to be clones of each other i want people to be have different personalities bring something to the environment whether that's coaching staff support staff players you know like people are a little bit different obviously we've all got the boundaries that we've got to fit into in terms of following, um, you know, what you do as a team. But I have no, I have no problem with the way players celebrate or what they do with their hair or whatever. And um, so, yeah, sometimes that can be good for a team sometimes because you want, you know, you want different personalities in the team because you hear sometimes the stories of, you know, going all teams. And, and the coaching environment, and they're all dour guys, and you know don't smile, don't have any fun, and the kind of that sort of permeates back into the team. I think sometimes, so you've got people with personalities, and you know can bring something different, and that can you know definitely be a plus for a side. Having worked with different coaches around the world, and really fascinated with with how people interact and how. Why is one winning environment better than the other? And I've worked in quite a few now, you know, you know, with yourself, Jamie Joseph, you know, um, uh, you know, Eddie Jones, you know, Sean Edwards, uh, you know, Die Young, loads of different people around the world, um, Michael Checker, and and all, and I've always seen in different environments what works. And you're right. I think when coaches are accessible, but they don't, they're not all the same. And you have one coach that might be the one that beats the drum but the other coach is the one you can go to with some emotional needs you know the director of rugby is clear but you're accessible so if I walk past you in the corridor you're going to say how are you Hask how's your missus how's your family how's everything you're not going to ignore me like I'm not there um yeah and that's it's so important because I, I think one of the questions I wanted to ask you was about you've never been frightened in having personalities within your team where a lot of coaches would shy away from having personalities because they, it appears to be too much trouble than it's worth oh I love it I love it, you know, different personalities again. And we probably did that at Wasp, you know, and and, and we were able to do that because we were successful and we had strong personalities who could, you know, people come in and didn't you know, step outside the boundaries and, and worked hard. Um, you know, I remember, uh, you know, when we, when we signed Matt Dawson and, and obviously people said, oh, I just signed Matt Dawson and he was, Supposedly seen as being probably not was it not, not the best. First of all, a little bit uppity or arrogant or whatever. Um, and I couldn't speak more highly than I remember. He came to Wasps, and at one of the first couple of training sessions, I know players were turning around going, "Oh my God, how the hell has this guy had fifty caps to 
England. He's useless. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and there was one training session. He passed the ball to Alex King and headed enough, and he just stopped there and he threw the ball back at uh, Dawson. He said, "I'm not taking that shit anymore." <laughs> and in fairness, Matt Dawson never said a word. But every day after training, he went down to the end of the field and went to some stuff with Whitey, did some extra fitness. He worked on his skills and his and his passing and everything. And, you know, and and we ended up winning the championship that year. But and I've got a huge amount of respect for, for Matt for the way he took that and, and then went away and showed his competitive edge to, to want to go and work hard and, and get better. So, yeah, we, look, I having different personalities and, you know, I, I go back to I, I love my days at Wasp, you know, yourself and, and Lawrence and Trevor Leota and, uh, you know, Fraser Waters. And <laughs> those guys. We had some, you know, guys from different different backgrounds and, and stuff but all with a common purpose and, and, a, and a common goal and goal and yeah and we, I think we got the balance right and I just said you know like with with teams and often with, with staff and the staff enjoy each other's company you know we're going to have uh, a beer after a long day and and often you know those are the best times for your meeting sort of stuff you you, you, you chat you discuss your selection you talk about different things and different ideas and and being able to enjoy people's company um that's what makes um, you know, doing this job when we're all under pressure, but if you enjoy each other's company and, and you're having a little bit of fun, it, it does make it a hell of a lot easier. I'm smiling to myself. Do you remember, you probably remember this, after the first game that Matt Dawson played and Sean was doing the analysis of the game and basically our game plan back then was to never kick the ball out, was to keep the ball in play so we would wear down our position, kick the ball into the middle of the field. And I remember first kick... The way, the, the, the way that Wales played against England and said that. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I wonder where they got that plan from. And basically, uh, Matt, Matt Dawson, first box kick, boots it out like most nines do. And I remember Sean, go, Sean goes... Right, lads, I'm not being fucking funny, but we don't kick ball out, right? <laughs> next, next thing... Uh, box kick other side of the field Matt Dawson kicks it out Sean gets up goes surprise fucking surprise Matt Dawson's kicked ball out again right and like Matt's getting hammered like he's obviously like not used to getting this amount of abuse and then kick three boots out again Sean just gets up boots a chair across the room and just walked out the meeting it was the fucking yeah. fun I was like oh my god I don't know how like nobody escaped that was the one beauty of Wasp yeah we, no it was yeah, that, and like I said, there was no excuses, was there? You know, and kind of, uh, you know, like I said, I got a massive amount of time for, for Matt and, and stuff. And but it didn't matter who you were, you know. This is this is who we are. This is what we do. And it didn't matter at what level you were, you, you got it. You know, if, if your performance wasn't good enough, or your skills, or you went went following things. So, that, what was interesting with the environment? Yeah. With the what interesting with the environment was. Because, and I said this in the book, you gave us enough rope to hang ourselves with, but the standards were really clear. So you were like, guys, you can go and enjoy yourself. You are men. Here is the expectation. You know, if you're not going to front up on training, you're going to get it. And if you don't front up, we had enough personalities around us that would then call you on it. So not only would you be getting into us, Sean Edwards, but you'll get, you know, an arm round from Lawrence. You know, someone like Alex King's going to call you out. Shaw's you take you to one side. And I think that's the perfect, yeah. when people talk about accountable environments, that's the perfect one. Yeah, and, and that's, you're 100% right. And if I can set those tones and standards to start with, then there's nothing greater than peer pressure. Um, and it doesn't need to be coming from the coaches and other players. They know the standards and they know sometimes when, when things are slipping and, and it's their job to, to make sure that, that things are on track. And that if you've got a team doing that, then you're definitely in a, in a pretty good place. Now, talking about kind of unique personalities and players with personalities, I know people, and I, I know it's my podcast, so I don't, you don't expect to blow smoke off my ass, but I, I'd love to know what you made of a young James Haskell rolling through your doors, a massive gobshite, lanky as fuck, with a lot to say for himself. I, I don't know what your, your first impressions were. You've ever, I don't know if you've ever been asked this before, but I'd love to know, and you can be as truthful as brutal as you want to. <laughs> well, the first thing, the first thing is that someone comes in there, you were thinking about the future because you'd already created Team Haskell. <laughs> <laughs> so you're already thinking, I'm, I'm going to be successful. So I, I kind of like that. And I don't know if you remember, but we sat down early on and I was, I said to you, so what's the season be like? you just come out of Wellington College and I think you'd played the school stuff. And I said, how many games have you played this year? And you, get, you went, well, last year, and you went, I oh, had 40-odd 40, 40 games. And I went, 
well, I only want you to play about 12 games. And you kind of looked at me with a surprise in 12 games. I mean, I said, because we're going to train you, we're going to put you in the gym and we're going to get you physically right. And you went from, I think it was 96 kgs to about 108 in a year. Yeah. And that, that following that year, you were sitting on the bench for the Wasps first team. Now, I think if we hadn't put that place or you'd gone somewhere else, that, that process might have taken three or four years for a normal player. But we decided, it was kind of saying, what's the product we want to end up? We want to get end up with someone with the right physical attributes to be able to play the game we want. And then we will, some, you will give them the rugby to, to correspond with that. And so, look, I think for yourself, James, you had a you know, great work ethic. Uh, you always enjoyed a bit of fun and a, and a laugh and a few beers and you were able to, to take the piss out of yourself and quite comfortably take the piss out of a few others as well. So, yeah. I was actually reflecting on um, you know my, my early days with Was when I was, was interviewing, and I, and I truly mean this, it's not tongue-in-cheek, you know, I... If I had gone to any other club out of school, I genuinely do not think I would have had the career and I don't think I'd be sitting here, purely because not only did you get me into physical position, but you allowed me to have my personality. You allowed me to be me. I was surrounded not only by great coaches, but by great players who who weren't intimidated, who had equal personalities or equally gobby. You know, Fraser Waters, for all of his, you know, was 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 ruthless. You know, um, you know, Josh Lucy, Phil Greening, Trevor Leota, all the, you know, all these guys. You know, even the young players that I still speak to, Ali McKenzie, Ben Gotting, Johnny Barrett, all these guys. Everyone had personality, but but you. You put me in the best position um, to do that. And uh, I'll never forget, do you remember, obviously, the, the Tuesdays, you remember um, the minute drill and the offload yeah. drill? I, I think I turned into the physical player I was because every week on those days, that was my World Cup final. Do you remember every week I'd be in that suit trying to fill someone in? All because I, all because I, I didn't think I was, I don't know, I got the idea that, you know, we were, we were a team that filled everyone in defence. We ran really hard. We knew our roles, but we were ultra aggressive. And I never forget that. You know, I say it in the book when I had that punch up with Trevor Leota, and you just came up and were like rubbing yeah. my shoulders, like that. There's my boy. Like, you know, if you keep doing that, you're going to be in the team. And like most, most, you know, I was terrified yeah. that Trevor was going to kill me, but that that was a, a big change for me. Yeah, no. Um, and I don't, so you wouldn't have known some of the things off off the field. I remember you come in and ask you for more money, I think it was your first year contract, the Saracens had offered you a bit more money and I kind of said, well, that's, that's it. If you want to go to Saracens and at the time they weren't the greatest club of the world. Uh, but we, I know with Wasp, we, we always struggled a bit financially. We never cheated on the salary cap. And I had to be try and be a little bit creative in terms of that because we had, uh, we had that, elite academy guys where we paid them all a flat. It was about 10 guys and had some great success come through. We played, paid them all 15K a year. And to, to, to survive in London on 15K is almost impossible. But guys were able to do that. And then the first year, I think, you came out and went to the first team squad, you got 25,000. And the next year, you got 27. And then you went to market rates. Um, and, we, and that kind of just kept... Uh, the books afloat and but we, everyone was on the same those players coming out of that and hand on heart I can I can remember having the conversations with Gruden saying I'm going to do everything I can to get you selected for England because if you don't play for England or I'm trying to stop you playing for England then I'm being a hypocrite because I wanted to play for the All Blacks I wanted to play for New Zealand and so yeah we might have players away on tours and whatever and that means that we're going to be probably not quite as competitive, but I genuinely wanted my players to play at the highest possible level. And I think the environment that we were creating, the success we had was giving those players an opportunity to to be seen by England and, and put themselves in the shop window because they were successful. And then, as you said, uh, success comes and then the other opportunities come later and the money and, and off the field stuff as well. And you know, hosting shows and doing podcasts and stuff, and you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, um, uh, you, you 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 had it taken three or four grand to, at that time to go somewhere else. You know, you might not be in this position. No, but I, I think to be honest with you, um, 
you know, what I learned early on is actually, you know, rugby and professional sport is much more about everything else that isn't money. You know, there's always, a, there's always, you know, if you always want to take things, care of things financially, but what's five or 10 grand extra or 20 grand extra where yeah. when you know you're in an environment that's going to make you better and you're going to actually play. And I, if you remember it, when I signed for Wasps, you know, we had Lawrence Alio, Joe Worsley, Johnny O'Connor, um, Dan Leo came in. We had um, uh, John Clark. There was like um, loads of back row, and it was like people were like, "You could have gone to another club that didn't have the competition." But I went there because if you're going to be the best or want to try to be the best, you've got to put yourself out there into the shop window and compete with these guys. Paul Volley, you know, all these guys yeah. are amazing. Oh, absolutely, and that's uh, a big part of it. I remember Phil Greeny one day, and it wasn't prompted, and he'd obviously been to Gloucester, he'd been to Sale. And at Wasps, and we we were under a, quite a significant amount of pressure because um, having success and, and players were clubs were coming along and offering players you know thirty or forty grand more to go somewhere else. And I remember Phil got up there and said, "Boys, you know, I've, you know, I've been around a little bit, whatever. I can tell you one thing. He said if you're going into every, into work every day and you're not happy, the money isn't worth it." And I thought it was a really really big thing for him to say in terms of, you know, it's, it's something, you know, always for players to think about, like you said, if it's five or 10 grand somewhere else, but if you're happy um, and you've got a chance of winning things and, and maybe getting higher honours, then that's where the rewards really come. One of the things I wanted to, to talk to you about was you seem to be as a coach um, really good at kind of the emotional intelligence part. You've touched on it about, um, you know that meant the mental toughness, but I kind of working out what your players need. Is that a really conscious thing? Do you try to work out and look at the group quickly? Who who needs an arm around them? Who needs maybe kick up the arse? Is that because that seems to be your specialty? Yeah, I, th- I think so. I think that's you're trying to get to know people, and you know some people's some players you now do, do need a, a boost and a bit of confidence and self belief, and others need to be to be driven and and then. I suppose going on from that is is how do you deliver the messages? You know, how do you do that? So I'll give you two examples. When I first went into Wales, um, we were training we were, we were training really hard and and at the start of the campaign at first year we won the Grand Slam. And I was I, I was I was saying I'd get my other coaches saying, No one's training harder than us. Ireland aren't training this hard, no one's going through this pain, England aren't training this hard, no one's working as hard as us. And um, by the end of it, as we're getting towards the uh, the Grand Slam, the players are going, come on, boys, no one's trading harder than us. No one's working harder than us. I've got no idea how hard everyone else was training, but we created that and, and they believed it. And that was and that was massive. And then I go back to uh, two years ago when we won the Grand Slam as well. As, you know, uh, We went to France with 16 nil down at halftime and, we were, you know, lucky got up and, and, and won that. And then I was replicating what was happening for the World Cup. So we took, we'd taken 31 players with us and we'd had a six day turnaround going into Italy. So I made 11 changes for the Italy game. And because for the World Cup, we had a four day turnaround and it was going to be the, a similar situation. And, I was kind of accused of disrespecting Italy and whatever. And anyway, we, we, we scraped through. And so we had, we'd had two games. We'd run out of two opening games away from home and hadn't played that week. And like Wales have had, had in the last game, we had a fortnight before the England game. And the message to the players going to that right from day one and the first week, we, we took them right to the edge physically. We absolutely pushed them to, um, to the limit, almost a breaking point. And that was just about creating that, that belief and the confidence and the, the, the work, the hard work ethic. And the message I was driving is they have no idea who's turning up. They have no idea. They don't know what's turning up because it's kind of been written off in the press. We know who's turning up. We know what's coming. They have no idea. And just kept driving that message for, you know, right up in, in, into the game. And, and, so yeah, definitely. At times, you know, there's certain themes that you that you drive on, and you know, what are the sort of buttons that you can push to get the best out of a team or, or best out of a player, and um, and having the, having good leadership group and, and good people around you. I mean, 
I know we've talked a bit about Wasps. There's no doubt that the, the best captain I've ever seen in the game is Lawrence Delalia in terms of you know what what at times he could bring in terms of a change of rooms and and get the players to that emotional level to for them to to perform on the pitch. But you can't do that all the time. And so you've got to, you've got to pick your games. You've got to pick your moments. And I think the way the modern game is at the moment is one, maybe two games of the year that you can get right to that very, very top of, of for yourself emotionally. It's, it's really hard to back those those things up week in and week out. So, um, so you really got to you got to pick your games when you do that. And for the rest of those games, you then have to rely on the process being well drilled, everyone being on the same the same you know sheet and all that kind of stuff because you can't keep peaking like that all the time. No, hundred percent. So, but it's it's just you get one or two games, and uh, and you know I've been lucky enough you know, to experience it on, on a couple of occasions. One was the in Australia with the Lions in two thousand and thirteen, where we'd won the first test, they won the second test, and I looked at them afterwards, and I went, "Wow, the emotional drain! They were just just the relief and beforehand, and they'd really got themselves up for that game, and it was a close game." And I went. I don't think they can, and we hadn't played as well as we could, and you know I don't, and they weren't able to bring that same sort of intensity or emotion the following week. Um, you know, we only put 40 points on them. And the other one was we played Leicester uh, in the last round, uh, 2004, um, and the winner went straight through to the final. And I completely underestimated. The emotion that day of Martin Johnson and Neil Black playing the last games at, at Welford Road, and we were on the scoreboard. We were well beaten forty odd points to twenty or something. And I went back at it, looked at looked at it afterwards, and we had 50-50 possession. They scored an intercept and there was another knock on. I went, yeah, it was not a hell of a lot in the game, but two weeks later, when we when we played it. Um, with the final at Twickenham, we were still on an upward curve and they weren't able to, to produce that same sort of emotion that they had that night at Welford Road and we put 40 points on them, you know, and just... So, those kind of... When you've been in those situations and had those experiences, yeah, like, you can't underestimate the emotional impact and getting that right and and what that can attribute to, to performance if you're able to do that. That's fascinating that you focus on that much on the emotional energy and you pick those bits up because I, I, you know, as an England player, I knew about the, the the rhetoric and the talk of Wales being the fittest. You know that that filtered down, you know, because even you're in the media, it was what you laced. You know, if you're going to say it in the media, you're going to say it into the team. It's going to filter throughout to, to everybody. And I and I, and I love it in hindsight. Like I don't know if we were the fittest, but as long as everyone's buying into it, <laughs> I don't know who who who. Yeah, you know, I don't know, but who cares? Exactly. If they believe it, that's exactly. great. Yeah. Did, but also, do, you know, because I. I saw firsthand like, that you weren't. You're not. In, you're always quite keen on like a like a sort of a mental game with people individually. Like I'll give you an example. So remember, we used to do power endurance, um, and uh, we used to do power endurance. It'd be you know on a Monday or Tuesday, and it would always be me versus Lawrence. And I couldn't understand why I was going out to sessions and Lawrence was trying to fucking kill me, and I couldn't understand. <laughs> I couldn't understand it. And it was only when before one week you took me to one side and you went. Listen, Hask, I don't, don't need to tell you this, but Lawrence says you're, you're, you're young, you're a bit soft, like you're never going to be any good. And I was like, fucking hell, did he actually say that? Right, okay, let's go and do it. And then we're having this session, we're going head to head, it's kicking off, and you know, we're going, we're going hammer and tongs. And it was only when he took me for breakfast, very kindly, like my, like my, like a stepdad took me out. He went, well, you know, reason is we're fucking, you know, going real tough. Is it, you know, Gat said that, uh, you know, you said I was old and past it. And I went, Lawrence. I never fucking said that you were old and past it. He goes, I said, Gats told me that you said I was young and shit and we're never going to do it. And then we both sit there and we were like, Gats, I can't believe you did that. Like, so I know you're not, imp- <laughs> you're not impervious to kind of a little, a little kind of, you know, um, kind of psychological game. Is there any moment that you, you sort of done that and it's kind of backfired on you? Is there moments where you've gone, you know, I thought this was going to really work and it hasn't come off? Oh, I gave Dylan Hartley a bit of crap from day in the- <laughs> Oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Yeah, about his light out throwing, and he, he had an absolute stormer. And uh, a couple of guys said to me, I think you're a bit out of line. And they're right, you know, you don't always get it right. And I went up in the um, after match afterwards and I shook his hand and said, Mate, I'm sorry, I said a couple of things, but I thought you played really well today. And so, 
you know, you've sometimes it doesn't it doesn't always work, and you've got to pick, you've got to pick the right moment. And look, at times I've said a couple of things and probably wish I hadn't have or it wasn't phrased the right way. But it's all about you know trying to put your thinking about your team and how you can get the best out of your players and just you know it might be little wee things like you said. Um, that, that, that those those things uh, you know can, can make a difference in terms of some players are just you know naturally competitive and aggressive all the time. Others need a, a little bit of a push, and and then you've got some of the older guys who you know they might be doing power endurance against each other, but they're they're looking after each other under about eighty percent. You know, they cut the old wily props, and so you let them go for a few days, and then you put them in with a youngster because. You, you you want to keep them honest, um, and that's that's part of the fun of it. That's kind of the the whole the whole thing, and uh, yeah, that's why why I love the game so much, and 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 the people that you're involved with, and uh, yeah, it makes it special. And I so I don't know if you'll you'll ever admit this because I know obviously people trawl through podcasts and stuff like that, and trying to find you know headlines, and we're not I'm not about that. But you strike me as the kind of guy, and I, and I would be exactly the same that you would say something in the media, even if you knew that it was going to get shit, but, but it was for the best for the team. Like, you know, I, I know, and you might not, you might say actually, look, you know, because you, the, the one thing I've always noticed is you always turn around and apologise. Like, remember the Dylan thing, for example, I remember you coming out saying, actually, do you know what? I thought you had a stormer. I got it wrong. I wonder if you sometimes, because I know Eddie does, is say stuff because you know it's for the best of the team, even though the media are going to give you, give you shit. And that's kind of part and parcel of being a head coach. Yeah, sometimes I don't. I don't always think about that. Uh, I kind of, I suppose sometimes, you know, they're always looking for an angle and, and I'm probably not quite the way I used to be, I'm much more, a little bit more reserved because you don't want to create headlines. And um, and and so it's it's thinking about, if, if I get asked a question or an opinion, I, I'll give an honest answer or give an opinion and then that can create a, create a headline because because of what you what you said and um and some people some outlets always looking for a headline i'll give a really a good, good example where um where when sometimes we were picking a Wales squad where we might have picked say 31 32 players and then we'd left a couple of players out of the squad and the headlines in Wales wouldn't have been about the new caps or the exciting guys who picked or the squad. It would be about the players who'd missed out and that would be the headlines. Something dropped, you know, major surprise, players dropped. And and I was always in looking for a negative. And so how do you how do you mitigate against that? So unfortunately sometimes we ended up picking maybe one or two players extra in our squad to negate what might possibly be the negative headlines the next day. And that's, and that's, that's disappointing because you want, when, when you're naming squads, you, you want to hopefully the people to some, sometimes focus on the positives and focus on, on like I said, new caps and, and selection. So, um, yeah, there's, yeah, there have been a few times when I've said a few things, but other, other times it's not always, it's a way it's been phrased. So, you know, with Eddie's, Eddie's a good example, and you know, Eddie and I go out for a few, a few drinks or a few meals and we catch up with each other. We know, we know it's a game, but he might have said something in a press conference, and I will get asked uh, the question, "What did you think about what Eddie Jones said about such and such and such?" And the journalist hasn't actually repeated what Eddie's said in that context. He's rather said what he's kind of said in the way he's interpreted it, and so. We can sometimes be a bit, bit explosive in the way that we respond because it's either having a crack at us or being being challenging. And then the journalists love that because then that's their headlines for the next few days. And they find out it wasn't what he said anyway, or wasn't the context he said. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And the same and the same goes with something I might have said. Oh, you know, to Eddie, what do you think about what Gatlin said about such and such? You know, so <laughs> I mean, um, I'm glad that you two yeah, like. There's no, but, you know, it's the, yeah, it's the media but just, world. You realise it. Yeah, you realise it, it's it's just a game. You get you're playing a game with the media, and and their job is to try and find, try and create 
sometimes some controversy and some headlines. I mean, that's and that's always good for them. And and I probably at this at the stage where you know trying to go the other way. And I I always I think I always think it's important to try and cre create or control the environment that you're in. So I hate. Um, someone in the media getting hold of the team or leaks out out the team that really drives me crazy because you know that's come could come sort of somewhere internally and those are the things that we can only we can control our environment so you've got to for me you know, the team not leaking or information not coming out of the the team environment is really important have you ever found have you ever, ever found anyone leaking anything you ever caught them uh yeah i, <laughs> I uh when I when I got Martin Williams back, uh, and I'd spoken to him, and it was going to be announcement. It was going to be a big announcement. And before we named the squad with to announce him, which would have been great news, someone had leaked it um, two hours beforehand to the press, so it had already leaked out. It wasn't actually someone in the squad; it was someone close to the squad. And uh, remember our old friend Kim West? Yeah, I got somehow he he got the number for me. Um, of the journalists uh, that he had spoken to, and it was a, a an ex player close to the team had had it. So I wrote the number up on the wall. Oh, really? And all, yeah, all the players knew this is where this is where the information came from. So all the players knew that. And so they boycotted uh, that player. That boycotted that player and kept kept lips tight from then on. Oh no, it's just he was an ex player, so. Um, oh, right. He's not. He's not buried you know, under the principality somewhere, is he? Like you just like, like, liquidated him or something like, like the mafia. Turns out, I love this. We were trying to be a really sensible podcast. And it turns out Warren Gatlin's part of the mafia and he's burying leaks in. Oh. Yeah, that'd be amazing. That's the headline now, Warren. You know that. Yeah, yeah. I love that. You, you and Robin McBride seen carrying a carpet out of the principality with a feet pair of feet sticking out of it. Oh. Oh yeah. Well, Robin McBride does look like an ex-murderer, doesn't he? He does, he does. He does. He does. <laughs> I've got. Um, what I want to talk about a little bit about is we talked about you, you bringing emotional energy to the team, but what I want to know about is you, is you personally, because every time I've never sat next to you in a game, I've never sat next to you in in a box. I've only ever seen you kind of post-match how you talk to players and at half time. And I would say you're passionate, but I've never seen you go completely mad. I've never seen you like oh, you know explode. What I want to talk about a specific thing about pressure is um, is you know for example in 2015 you know the England Wales game uh, you know sort of the 24 hours around that game you know did you did you did you feel that real pressure in that game because the way you celebrated afterwards I've never yeah. seen you celebrate like before oh I no probably I, I, I do celebrate and I celebrate normally but afterwards or the next day I'd be jumping around and. Um, just after things have settled in, um, oh look, that was a that was a big moment for, for us in terms of you know down how many players we'd lost during the game and a nine putting bigger back to fullback and nine on the on the wing and um, yeah it's, it's and to, to, we stayed in the we talk we always talk about staying in the arm wrestle and staying in the battle and, and we did that and to to come out on top was 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 pretty special so. Um, yeah, often, often what happens is that the cameras turn on you sort of 20, maybe 20 seconds after the event, but often I'm, you know, they're um, celebrating or, you know, showing some emotion, but they kind of, uh, you know, the persona of me is that I'm sort of dour and I don't, don't show any emotions or celebrate. And, and, and I don't mind that because if that's the perception of me from the outside, then that's fine because the people who know me well enough and know me is that you know I enjoy having a laugh and a bit of fun and stuff and and but I, I, I have no problem with the perception from from other people um, about who I am um, that's fine so if they think I'm a dour bastard and doesn't smile or anything then. That's okay. Well, I, I remember it's not, when um, it's not an issue for me. I know? remember early on in your wasps. I think you were getting your teeth done. I remember you had a break, and every time you laughed, you didn't want to open your mouth, <laughs> and then you always oh, like to laugh yeah. a lot. So every time you're laughing, you're like, "I was like, what does he like? Is he trying not to laugh?" And then I, then I realized oh, you're getting the old braces on. That I, was funny. I had, to, I had to get some. I had to get some braces on to fix a gap in my teeth and stuff, and then I kind of regretted it afterwards. <laughs> 
<laughs> Every you know, time, yeah, so. trying to hide your laugh. But one, what I want to know is, you know, as someone who's like driving the bus, using that analogy, so you're driving the bus, but you don't have control, as it were. So, that, you know, as a coach, you can, you know, set the scene, get the staff, do everything, but you don't go on the field. How, how do you manage that stress well? Did you Are you happy to take the pressure off or do you get real fucked off about stuff? Probably when I was a bit younger as a coach, would do that more, but I think that's, you know, I suppose everyone's got to understand their roles and, and delivering the messages and expectations of what we want and how we're going to play, and then there's clarity and understanding. And if, and if we get that, look, players are going to make mistakes. Um, I make mistakes. You know, coaches make mistakes, and you don't get things right all, all the time. Um because there is one decision that you obviously had a lot of influence over was kind of the you know the third test in, in 2013 you, you know you touched on it you know dropping Brian O'Driscoll kind of a, a Lions legend and the whole of Ireland on you you know people it, it, you know at the time it wasn't a popular decision but I remember watching that game um, as a fan and you left the kind of you left the field after the the game and it was sort of like um you know, you would approve right. It was the right decision. It was the right thing for the team. But it was sort of like you were done with it. You know, you 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 know. I mean, how big a call was that? How much of a pressure moment? Because that was that was one of those seminal moments. It it went well, but were you feeling the pressure in that moment? Oh, absolutely. Because you know, for me, I was the person who gave Brian his first cap, and basically to be the first person to drop him in his rugby career. Um, but I need to say that. You know, there's five of us as coaches. We were 100%, uh, 100% consensus that that was the right decision to do. And when you make big calls like that, and, um, there's, there was an easy solution. There was a soft solution, and the soft solution was to put them on the bench. And people would have been up in arms that Brian O'Driscoll wasn't playing, but at least he's on the bench, and that would have been okay. But for me, my job was to win a, a test series for the Lions in Australia. So we picked the team and then we looked at the bench and Manu Tuolagi was fit again. And so I kind of looked at it with you know, 10 or 15 minutes to go. If we're making a change in the, in the midfield, uh, who's who's potentially going to make maybe the biggest impact from a, if, if we need it. And so, you know, we didn't just drop them, you know, we didn't pick Brian and, you know, like I said, the soft, easy decision was to put him, put him on the bench. But to, 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 you know, you've got to believe and have the convictions that if you make a hard call, you've got to do do what, what you think is right at the time. And that doesn't mean that afterwards you don't reflect on it, don't think about it and say, you know, was that the right decision or was that the right call? And, and in the meeting... I'd said to the coaches, there's going to be a bit of a fallout from this. Uh, but I had no idea what the fallout was. It was absolutely massive, you know, in terms of... Um, and then I went I went to go on the field afterwards because I wanted to sort of enjoy enjoy the, the win with the players and, and celebrate, not, not, not to gloat or anything like that. And I just couldn't get away from the, the newspaper hacks around me and... The, um, I just, after about 20 or 30 seconds, I said, oh, come on, guys, you just give us a bit of room. I want to go and enjoy the joy with the players. And they just didn't, they wouldn't move. And I said, oh, fuck yeah. And then just turned around and walked and sat in the change rooms, uh, went in there, opened a beer and, and sat on my own for about 10 minutes in, in the change rooms. Um, was there a real sense well, of relief? Well, was there like a sense of relief that the decision had come off? Because yeah, it, it was such a well, big one. Yeah, I, not, not really. I mean, the first, the, the first question in the press conference was, oh, Warren, you must feel vindicated by the decision to drop Brian O'Driscoll. And if I'd said yes, that would have been the headline. Gatlin vindic feels vindicated and, and again created another bit of controversy. And I just went, no, it's not the way I look at it. I said, the hardest thing I've ever had to do as a coach. Uh, it wasn't the easiest thing. Um, and you know, like I said, it doesn't mean you don't reflect on was, was it still the right decision. And again, you got to remember, and I keep always saying to people, selection is just a matter of opinion. That is all it is. And I, I see at the moment, no one's doing me any great favours at the moment in terms of the line selection. 
you you pick up the papers or you read the stuff on a Monday after the weekend's games, and depending on what country you come from or where you come from, people picking their lines 15. And this unbelievably varied you know, in terms of the differences and who should be in certain positions uh, at the moment. If you're in Wales, it's a Welsh bias. If you come from Scotland, there's a Scottish bias at the moment. You know, in Ireland, they'll have a number of... And that's completely understandable. But I've got to say to people, like I said, it's just a matter of opinion. If you went down to the pub with a group of mates and 60 and said, OK, let's pick our lines starting 15, I guarantee you there'd be quite a big difference in what the five or six of you think in terms of that. So, um, you know, we, we've got to do a job that and hopefully make what we think are the, the right decisions or the best possible decisions. But we understand, and the great thing about the game is that um, you don't want everything to be predictable, and people are going to disagree with you, and they're entitled to their opinions. There's nothing wrong with that, and that's that's the beauty of the game. The one thing that we always get asked by the media as players is, what's it like to play against um, you know fellow teammates from club level? You know, and we always talk about the same thing. Listen, it doesn't matter because you're, you know, you're going to be super competitive and it's irrelevant. You've obviously got mates that are coaches. Now, even though you're not taking to the field, what are you like when it comes up against a friend as a coach? Do you like, do you still talk to them? Do you love like getting one over them? Do you like, I'm always interested by that because it's never really asked. Like, what do you, you know, what, how do you deal with that? Do you rub it in? Do you call them up and go, fuck you, I beat you? Or you like, do you really, you know, like, I'd love to know about that. Some coaches, yeah, yeah a better relationship with a, a few a few times with different coaching teams we would have gone out for dinner on say the thursday or friday night before that we've done that with england a couple of times um coaches going out for dinner on the friday um or the thursday night we've done that with south africa we've done that with the all blacks um and that's and that's always good and we, we don't i think we understand uh, you always want to beat your mate. There's nothing. That's, that's the biggest thing, you know, in, in terms of of doing that and someone that you've got some rivalry with. Um, but it's it's. I, I suppose it, the last thing you do is you don't go and rub it in or anything like that because we understand that the pressures that at this level we're all under, you know. And so, um, you know, the last thing that you would have been doing in the weekend if I was coaching Wales would be rubbing it into Eddie because you, you know the next day on a Monday he's getting some crap from the media and um, t- so and and the next time it could be me so you know, look we all, we all understand so it's surprisingly uh, even though we're so competitive and want to win I think there is a genuine element of support for each other and, and an understanding of of what we go through as coaches and what it's like to be in that fishbowl where all eyes are on you and because you're the you're the front person where they're not actually talking about anyone else or any of the, any of the other coaches in the environment. They're just really having a, a a real go at you, and that's that's what we do. That's why we you know, we love the game. And and if if you weren't able to put up with that, then we wouldn't have been involved. So. Look, I don't expect you to name them, but do you do you have like one nemesis out there that you just one you know like maybe the coach or something or a team remember to you that, that you're like when it when it comes round to that you're like. Even like even more competitive. I wonder because there's always teams that, you know, being an England player, everyone hates the English, right? It doesn't. I don't expect you to say that, but we know it. We you know it. Everybody knows it. Um, everyone loves to beat us for all the all the reasons that it's been talked about. So I, yeah. as a player, I don't, I don't. I don't think the Welsh boys do. They, yeah, um, they, they, the Welsh boys didn't like it one day when I said like, I've lived in Ireland and faced Ireland. And I said. And then we talk about hate. You don't hate the English as much as they. Oh yes, we do. We hate the English. <laughs> I said, no, I think there's there's a closeness because of proximity and yeah. the relationship between you know like Newport and, and Bath and the old clubs used to have them playing Gloucester and and you know, Worcester and Bristol and those ones and going across the bridge. Look, there's there's an intense rivalry. There's no doubt about that. But I, I I'm not sure about hate. That. I think it's yeah. Um, I just wondered if there's think, a secret name. I I the, the Irish thing, maybe it's and more history goes on. I think people stop talking about 700 years of oppression yeah. and stuff and things. So, um, yeah, there's there's uh, one or two individuals that I'm very very motivated to be. <laughs>
Such good language. Yeah. I'm very motivated to be. I like that. I like that. We haven't, <laughs> there's no headlines yeah. there. There's no like. There's no words of hate, but motivated. That's. I, I agree. There's lots of people I was motivated to to beat, but I love that. So that when when you know it's that game, you just put an extra bit of effort in, a little bit more, you know, bit of happiness if you get the win. Oh yeah, you jump for joy and uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, Warren, thank you so much for your time today. Um, you know, I really, I really meant what I said about you, you helping with my career. I think some of the stuff you've, been, is, is, you've said is fascinating. It's so interesting to now see that the influences on you really shaped you. And as you're right, so many coaches go away from what they liked because they think they have to do something or they do something out of fear instead of doing something that they believe in. And a lot of coaches change under pressure. And it's great to hear that you, you know, you, you, you've done that and shaped that. So thank you so much for, the, for coming on. Cheers, James. I've really enjoyed that. And uh, good luck to you with uh, all your training. And Thanks, mate. This is you're doing. And I will say, if the Lions tour happens... I, I, I keep seeing you everywhere. Yeah, I am everywhere. Uh, I'm a bit like yeah. um, I'm a bit like the, the pandemic. As soon as you think you got rid of me, I pop back up again. <laughs> I, you, know, you know someone once described me as the international equivalent of an unflushable turd, which every time you think <laughs> I, get, I get rid of you. But I was going to say something. If, you, if the Lions tour happens, you need a social secretary, kit man, a bag man. I had a lot of fun last time. You know I'm a good team man. I'm happy to, yeah, I know. to come out there. You were, you were brilliant. That's one of the reasons I took you. I said, you know, we had that conversation that you might not be involved in the test match matches but you know having individuals could help bring a, a squad together and do that um that's that's so vital and you know definitely you're one of those people Thank you, Warren. Well, listen, if you want to um, read more about Warren, then his autobiography, The Pride and the Passion, was published in, in uh, November 2019. It's out now. For those of you tuned into the podcast, I'm James Haskell. I was talking to Warren Gatlin today. Please subscribe. Pick up a copy of my book. You can hear more about my relationship with Warren and some of the stuff that he did to help me in my career and some of the adventures we went on. Uh, remember, it's a YouTube show as well. Uh, subscribe, leave feedback, and I'll catch you all very soon. 